I'd like to show you how we can use put call parity to figure out what the lower bound or minimum value of the call or put option is. And I'll also show you how we can easily understand how to incorporate the dividend into the lower bound or minimum value. And that's by just remembering that the role of the dividend here is to reduce the stock price. In the upper left, I have here highlighted in yellow the six inputs that are the classic assumptions that go into the price or valuation of a European style call or put option, according to Black Scholes Merton. And I've also grouped them. I hope this is interesting. Here on the left, these three stock volatility and dividend yield, typically denoted small q. These three assumptions you'll notice are features of the underlying asset, in this case, the stock price. Over here, I have strike or exercise price, often denoted K or X, and I also have the term or maturity of the option. And you'll notice those would be contractual features of the option, which is the derivative that references the underlying stock. And then I also have the risk-free rate. And the risk-free rate is external to either the underlying asset or to the option. And then also you'll notice the stock price today, that's very observable. The strike and term, those are contractual, those are features of a contract, so those are very objective. But volatility, we want an estimate of today's volatility, which is always an estimate, so not necessarily objective at all. And the dividend yield, although we know it historically for the company, we really want in the model the projected dividends going forward. So this is a projectant projection and has more subjectivity than the stock price. The risk-free rate also, it's external. And we can, of course, observe the interest rate on a U.S. Treasury bill, for example, and use that as the risk-free rate. However, somebody else could disagree with us about the choice of that. So there's an element of subjectivity in the risk-free rate. I hope that grouping is interesting. Then if we took a, take a look at the uh, lower bounds, I have a column here for the call, and I've den denoted that with a small c. Again, small c denotes a European as opposed to American. If it were capital C, then I, would, then I would mean an American style call. Small p here is a European style put. And I've priced the call and the put according to these input assumptions with the Black Scholes Merton. And that's in rows that I've hidden because that's not my focus here currently. I just wanted to show those prices. And I've also got the intrinsic value. Intrinsic value, this is an at the money option, either call or put, so it has a zero intrinsic value currently. In the previous video, I reviewed put call parity, which I'll use here to infer the lower bounds. There are other approaches to getting at the or memorizing the put, uh, lower bounds, but I think this is a good one because we could just reuse our memorization from put call parity. And you may recall that what I said, the way that I like to remember a put call parity is I say on the left, we have a call plus cash. And that's the strike price discounted to today because it's all in present value terms. Our call plus cash or discounted strike is equal to a protective put, which is a long put plus the underlying stock price. And that, that's S sub zero and that in this case, that's the $30. So if we want to solve this for the call, right? That's straightforward. It's the put plus stock minus the discounted cash or the, I'll just call that the cash. And the lower bound on the call then is going to be equal to this expression. If we have the lowest possible value for the put, what is that? The put must be worth at least zero. So if we drop that out, you'll notice we get the minimum value or lower bound for a European style call. It's the stock price currently minus the discounted strike. Very easy, right? And now if I do the same thing for the put, take our put call parity, solve in terms of the put, right? It's call plus discounted strike or cash. And 
but this time I'll be, oh, no, sorry, I'll be subtracting the stock price. And now what's the minimum, minimum value of this put? Well, it depends on what's the lowest possible value here of the call, which would be zero again. And so if that drops out, we get the lower bound or minimum value of the put. And in this case, it's the discounted strike minus the stock price, sort of the reverse of the call. Very straightforward. Now I'll just add the dividend. Okay, so also here, there's a couple ways to think about it. Here's how I like to think about it. And that is, let's just take a stock like Apple, which I happen to own Apple. And let's just say that our for, for our stock Apple, our expected total shareholder return is 15%. For me, it's actually done better than that over the last few years, but even 15% would be great. Total shareholder return, that means price appreciation plus any dividend received. Now, if Apple pays no dividend, then of course, we would expect that total shareholder return of 15% to show up as all as price appreciation of 15%. Now let's just imagine a shift such that Apple pays a 3% dividend. Then what would we expect the price appreciation to be if we still expect the same total shareholder return of 15%? Well, we expect the price appreciation to be 12%. After all, we don't think we're gonna get a 3% dividend and price appreciation of 15%. We expect the total shareholder return of 15% to be allocated between dividend and price appreciation. Or if Apple's gonna go up to 5% dividend, then we would expect the share price to be, appreciation to be about 10%. And for me, an extreme example of this is REITs. I hold a couple of REITs. REITs pay most of their total shareholder return in dividend. Consequently, as shareholders, we don't expect as much on the price appreciation. Why is that significant? Because we're talking about an option on the asset. So if you have an option on Apple, you forego the dividend. The greater the dividend, the lower the price appreciation, conditional on the same total shareholder return. And so as the option holder, you're going to enjoy the gain on the price appreciation, but not the dividend. Higher the dividend, the lower your expectation on the price appreciation, because as the option holder, you forego the dividends. And so for this reason, a general rule that we can use that, that will be handy throughout option pricing is that dividend reduces the share price. And that's all we need to do to modify this lower bound to include dividend. Now I'm using a capital D here, and that's because over up here, our input assumption for dividend yield is usually expressed this way as, as a constant proportion or in continuous terms as you like. But I did do a conversion here into its present value lump sum amount. I'll put that equation in the explanation because I don't want to go, I don't want to derive that here. But safe, suffice to say, a continuous dividend yield can always be translated into its lump sum equivalent, which I've denoted D here. So just keep in mind, we're just going to replace S with S minus D. And going back to our lower bound then, for the call, right, we're going to have the lower bound of the call is going to be stock minus, well, let me start that over. Call equals stock, but I'm going to use minus dividend instead, minus the discounted strike. And so by replacing stock with stock minus dividend, I've now given my, I've now expressed the lower bound on a European style call. And for the put, maybe this may be a little unexpected what's coming here. We take um, discounted strike and subtract the stock price again, reduced by the dividend, but you'll notice then that means that the dividend gets added. So the dividend here is going to reduce the lower bound on the call, but it's actually going to increase the lower bound on the put. And there is a good intuition on that, but I won't go into that now. And so in that way, I've taken the form the formulas here, um, just capture that dynamic. 
for my European style call. It's the maximum of zero. After all, the lower bound can't be lower than zero. And the stock price minus the lump sum dividend minus the discounted strike. And then for the put, it's the discounted strike minus the stock plus the lump sum dividend. So for my at the money option here, $30, I'll introduce a dividend. Let's say I'm gonna be really aggressive here and say 5%. Okay, that's more aggressive than I need to be. I'm gonna do 2%. And then for my European style call, you'll notice at the money here, dividend yield of 2%, lower bound without the dividend, $1.46, but I, with the dividend, it's reduced. Okay. And I'm gonna to need to make this, I'm gonna change the stock price assumption here now to make this an in the money put. And then we'll notice here, without the dividend, lower bound is 354, including the dividend yield, our lower bound actually increases for the European style put. Okay, so that's lower bound for European style calls and puts, both without dividend and with dividend. And just remember, the way to incorporate our dividend is to reduce the stock price by the lump sum dividend. Thank you. If you enjoyed the video, please subscribe to the channel and you'll get notified, I think, of the next one.